Good morning, everybody. So I'm going to talk about what's new in CLL in 2023. I'm not going to um, talk about novel agents or, or new things that we don't yet have access to. Uh, Piers will cover on, uh, touch on some of those in his session next, talking about clinical trials. So I'm really focusing on um, drugs that we have access to currently or that we expect to um, in the near future. And so therefore, I'm going to focus mainly on ibrutinib and venetoclax in combination. So we've just got access to that through NICE, um, really within just the last month. So that is a, a new drug combination that we now have access to in the NHS in the UK on the Cancer Drug Fund. So I'm going to talk about how easy is it to deliver? What's the evidence for it? Um, what side effects or toxicity do we need to be aware of? And setting it in the context of the treatments that we already have available to have a bit of a thought about where does it fit in amongst our other treatments. But to be quite honest, I think we don't completely know the answer to that yet. I will talk a little bit about Zanabrutinib, um, just a few slides at the end, but we don't yet have access to Zanabrutinib, but it is being uh, considered by NICE currently. So we may have access to Zanabrutinib by the end of 2023. So in order to think about where we are in what's new in 2023, we need to think about where we were in 2022. Um, Ros has already sort of mentioned this guideline for the treatment of CLL published by um, the British Society of Haematology last year. And as she said, we're already looking at a potential update of the treatment section of things because things are moving so quickly. I understand that this is one of the most clicked on um, uh, publications of 2022. So possibly just demonstrating how complicated the treatment of CLL is when we have so many different novel agents and we're trying to choose which is the right one. Going to this figure from that guideline. So this is just a figure of a treatment algorithm giving a bit of an idea of the drugs we have available in frontline therapy um, and also in second or third line relapsed refractory patients. And I'm going to focus here on the bit I've put in the red box. Um, I'm going to see if I can get rid of the little thumbnail I've got there because that's getting in my way. There we go. So if we focus on what we've got uh, in the red box, we're talking about frontline therapy. And you can see here, obviously, as Ros has already shown you, the availability of some of the novel agents. Chemo immunotherapy is sort of in a dotted line there because we're really thinking that's not applicable anymore now in the era of novel agents in the UK. But I'm going to focus on I plus B, so ibrutinib and venetoclax in combination, and highlighting that we only have it available in this row here in frontline therapy. We don't have access to I plus B in the relapsed refractory setting. And as I say, this was just approved by NICE at the very end of last month. And so we have ibrutinib and venetoclax. Um, as an option for untreated CLL, but not in the relapsed or refractory setting. And using ibrutinib and venetoclax together um, is looking at this sort of theoretical possibility of a synergistic action between a bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitor, such as ibrutinib, working alongside venetoclax. So if we look at the top left bit of this first, we know that when we give BTKI, such as ibrutinib, we know that we mobilize CLL cells from their sort of protective microenvironment in the lymph nodes out into the blood. We see this when we give patients ibrutinib or acalabrutinib because you'll see that their white count goes up initially. That's definitely something to warn patients about because otherwise they might be a bit alarmed. So we know that when we start a BTKI, the white blood cells, the, the CLL cells tend to come out of the lymph nodes where they're being protected and they and end up in the peripheral blood. So the lymphocytosis goes up initially. But we believe that there is a synergistic action with venetoclax and that ibrutinib actually sensitizes CLL cells to the BCL2 inhibition action of venetoclax. So Roz has already explained a little bit about how venetoclax works. I always just have a sort of picture in my mind, like the diagram she showed you of the BCL2 protein being an anti-apoptotic protein. It's hanging on to any pro-apoptotic proteins so that they can't do their job. But if venetoclax goes along and binds to BCL2, then it has to release the pro-apoptotic proteins and then they can go and do their job and apoptose CLL cells. There's a lot of interest and there's been a lot of research in recent years looking at venetoclax and ibrutinib um, in combination. And at ASH last year, there was an oral session just focused on six abstracts to do with venetoclax and ibrutinib in combination. I'm going to focus just on these two. So there are many other studies looking at this doublet combination of drugs, but I'm going to show you the data just focusing on the Captivate study and the GLOW study. So looking at GLOW, first of all. So this was a randomized trial comparing abrutinib and venetoclax 
in combination against chlorambicil and abinutuzumab. And this is the um, combination that we've been given access to in NICE, uh, in the UK through NICE. So a brutal and venetoclax for 15 cycles of treatment altogether. So there's a three cycle abrutinib lead in where abrutinib is given on its own, and then the venetoclax is added in. And so you have 12 cycles of abrutinib and venetoclax in combination, 15 cycles or 15 months essentially of treatment in total. In some other studies, the combination has been given slightly differently, um, but this is how we have access to abrutinib and venetoclax um, in the UK now. And this is being compared in this study with chlorambicil and abinutuzumab. Now, we'll look a little bit about some data from the CLL14 trial a little bit later on. Uh, Ros has shown you some of those slides already. The CLL14 trial is where we got access to venetoclax and abinutuzumab. So that's what led to the licensing of that drug combination. And in that study, venetoclax and abinutuzumab was compared, as with the GLOW study, with chlorambicil and abinutuzumab. And it was looking at an older patient population. And this population in the GLOW study is exactly the same as that CLL14 population. So an older patient population, either over the age of 65 or younger, but with comorbidities and specifically using this SIR score or cumulative illness risk score um, to assign which patients were eligible for the study. So looking at patients with comorbidities or older patients. This is a, a frontline treatment study. So patients have not had any previous treatment for CLL. And just worth noting that patients uh, with a deletion 17P or known P53 gene mutations were excluded from this study. And I've just highlighted at the bottom there that the median age of patients in this study was 71. So a very typical kind of patient population. We know that many of our CLL patients are in their 70s, and this was an older uh, patient population in this study. A little bit of a contrast in the CAPTIVATE study. This was not a randomized study. This was a phase two single arm study. Again, exactly the same fixed duration uh, drug combination. So three months of brutinib then venetoclax is added in, so then you've got 12 months of both of them in combination. The Captivate study had two different cohorts. They also did an MRD guided cohort where there was the option for continuing on with treatment uh, beyond that 15 months. But I'm not going to talk about that because that's not how we have access to I plus V in the NHS now. We have this 15 month fixed duration treatment. And then just worth highlighting here, a slightly different patient population in this study. So these were younger patients. Patients were all under 70 uh, with good performance status. Um, again, frontline patients, no previous treatment for CLL. But the median age in this study was 11 years less than the GLOW study. So the median age in the Captivate study of the patient population was 60. So looking first of all, just at the simple progression-free survival in the GLOW study. So we're looking here. Um, at 30 months follow-up of I plus V versus chlorambicil and abinutuzumab. And you can see here clearly that a brutinib and venetoclax combination is doing much better than the chemoimmunotherapy combination of chlorambicil and abinutuzumab. That in itself isn't a surprising result. We would expect that. We know from the CLL14 data that when we give venetoclax and abinutuzumab in combination to chlorambicil and abinutuzumab, the venetoclax arm does much better. And we know from many studies now that novel agents in CLL have better progression-free survivals and outcomes than when we use chemoimmunotherapy. So this in itself is not a surprising result, but it's useful just to have a bit of a look at the kind of outcomes we can expect for our patients, this 80% progression-free survival at 30 months in the I plus V arm. So they've had 15 months of treatment and then 15 months later, 80% of patients remain progression-free. Looking at the CAPTIVATE study, remembering this was a younger set of patients, We've got some uh, charts on the left showing a sort of overall response. So overall response, including the green bars, which were complete response and the blue bars of partial response. And we can see here 96% of patients had a response to the I plus V um, combination. So virtually all of the patients responding to this combination and over half of them um, achieving a complete remission. It's just worth noting there. I mean, you know, if this was diffuse large B cell lymphoma or AML, you know, we'd, we'd need a complete response, but CLL is different. It's very common that in, with our treatments, we may see a partial response and that can, be, that can be sufficient because it's about patients being well, either on or off treatment and not needing to go on to new treatments again because of further progression. So a partial response um, is often what we see when we're treating CLL patients and that's not automatically a bad thing. We don't have to necessarily seek a CR. And then we can see in the Kaplan-Meier curve on the right-hand side here, 
not quite such long follow-up in this study that I'm presenting to you here, um, but 96% progression-free survival at two years. Um, I'm just sort of focusing as, at this stage on all comers here, so the all treated patients. You can see that they've presented the data there, um, separating patients according to whether they have the deletion 17P or not versus all comers. We'll look at that in a little bit more detail as we go on. So we've seen there, many patients respond to this treatment, good progression-free survivals in both older patients and younger, fitter patients. How easy is this treatment to deliver? Um, there's sometimes some hesitancy about venetoclax-based regimens. Um, you will all be aware, I'm sure, and I'll show you a little picture of it as we go along about the need to um, titrate up venetoclax over a period of five weeks because of the risk of tumor lysis when we start venetoclax. So there can sometimes be some hesitancy about venetoclax-based regimes because, as Ross said earlier, they can be a pain to deliver. What about toxicities with this combination and which patient should we be giving this to? So first of all, how easy is it to deliver? Well, I've told you the GLOW study was older comorbid patients with a median age of 71. And in fact, two thirds of the patients, 67% of the patients in the study had hypertension and 70% of them in the I plus V arm had a SERS score of over six. So looking at this older comorbid population, about three quarters of the patient managed to complete the prescribed treatment. So um, just under 30% of the patients didn't actually get through all of the treatment, but three quarters of the patients did. In contrast, in the CAPBAIT study, younger, fitter patients, over 90% of patients managed to complete the I plus V as prescribed. Looking at the adverse events. So firstly, I'm just gonna highlight a couple of things here in the green box. I've mentioned diarrhea. So 50% all grade diarrhea. So I would be warning patients, there's a good chance you'll get diarrhea on this combination. 10% of those grade three or four diarrhea. So possibly needing treatment or even hospitalization in 10% of patients. At least a third of patients getting grade three or four neutropenia. So that means a neutrophil count of, one, of less than one. Um, hypertension and atrial fibrillation. Ros has mentioned already, and you may already be well aware that we know when we use BTK inhibitors and particularly abrutinib, that we are always wary of the risks of hypertension and atrial fibrillation. So just highlighting the rates of those in this study. Then just to pick out in addition, there were four uh, cardiac deaths, sudden deaths in the GLOW study. Bearing in mind, this is an, an arm of patients of 106 patients treated, four sudden cardiac deaths in that group of patients. The four cardiac deaths all occurred in patients with quite high SERS score, so SERS score of 10 or more, or with a performance status of two or more. And many of those patients also had a history of hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular risk factors. So it is certainly worth mentioning in this older comor comorbid population that with this I plus V combination, we definitely see some significant cardiac toxicities. In the Captivate study, younger, fitter patients, Again, they saw diarrhea, all grade diarrhea in 60% of patients, 66% of patients, very similar rate of grade three or higher neutropenia. So a third of patients getting down to a neutrophil count of one or less. Um, just under 10% of grade three or four infections, so meaning uh, infections that are going to need treatment or possibly hospitalization. They saw three serious bleeds. You'll be aware from what we've talked about already that bleeding is certainly a risk factor with ibrutinib. They saw three serious bleeds only one sudden cardiac death. So in summary so far, how easy is it to deliver I plus V? I would be telling patients to expect neutropenia and diarrhea because we've seen that commonly in this combination in both older and younger fitter patients. The diarrhea, whilst affecting a lot of patients um, at the all grade level, tends to be quite short lived. So it seems to be a median duration of just a couple of weeks. So I would warn patients there's got a good chance of getting diarrhea, but it should settle down. I think in older patients, patients with comorbidity and certainly patients with cardiovascular risk factors, I would be quite wary of using this combination. And then I've just highlighted there the figures of uh, atrial fibrillation and hypertension in the GLOW study, um, just to give us an idea of the sort of incidence of grade three or higher AF or hypertension that was seen in, in that combination. We've not mentioned tumor lysis syndrome. And we know that when we give venetoclax in AML, or in CLL, tumor lysis syndrome is always a risk. When we give uh, venetoclax in CLL, we use this ramp up strategy and we use this 
when venetoclax is given as part of the I plus V combination. So just the same as you may have used before when venetoclax is given on its own or with rituximab or with abinutuzumab. So ramping up the dose over five weeks to the full dose from, five, from week five onwards. When we give uh, venetoclax in combination with ibrutinib, there's that three month ibrutinib lead in first. And in fact, in the studies, it appears that TLS has been extremely rare when the two drugs are given in combination because essentially the abrutinib is debulking the disease before the venetoclax even starts. Um, and therefore, by the time you get to start the venetoclax, the vast majority of patients who might have started the treatment um, with high or medium risk disease for tumor lysis, the vast majority of those patients, by the time they actually started the venetoclax ramp up, were low risk for tumor lysis. So it seems to be very, very rare when the drugs are given in combination. So much more difficult. Who should we give it to? I've just lined it up there alongside our other frontline therapy options. There are lots of options written down there, seven if we include the chemoimmunotherapy. I think in my head, I really focus on, on two and now the third one of I plus V. So venetoclax have been a tuzumab would certainly be one of my go-to frontline therapy options. A calibrutinib, you'll see on the guideline there that there's a plus minus for abinutuzumab. Um, abinutuzumab in combination with acalabrutinib is licensed, but we can't use it on the NHS because it wasn't approved in that combination by NICE. So if your patients are being treated privately, you have the option to give them abinutuzumab in combination with acalabrutinib, but on the NHS, we need to give acalabrutinib on its own. And now we have I plus V to add. So how are we going to choose who gets what? Really important thing to say straight off, I think, is there are no absolute right or wrongs. And as Ros and I have both mentioned as we've gone along, um, the BCSH guidelines in treatment of CLL are going to be under review now that we've got I plus V. Um, and really, all of these treatments are options for all of our patients. There's no absolute right or wrong. So if I'm thinking about what are the options and what things should I think about in my patient for making a treatment decision, I'm probably thinking about all of the things on, written on this slide and you know, some other things might come into play with individual patients as well. First of all, in very simple logistical terms, you obviously need to look at the guideline and see what's available to you, depending on whether your patient is a treatment naive or a relapsed refractory patient. But we've said, if we're thinking about frontline, we're thinking about venetoclax, abinutuzumab, acalabrutinib, um, or I plus B now. Thinking about some disease specific features, so P53 status and IGVH status, we'll talk a little bit about those. Obviously, if there are trial options available and the patient uh, is willing and eligible to take part in a trial, then we should certainly be considering that. Thinking about specific treatments, we need to think about cardiac history and whether the patient is anticoagulated, thinking about some of the toxicities and side effects, particularly BTKIs. And then Ros has already said, age and fitness, I've put a question mark on that now. Is that really an issue? Because we've seen with many of these combinations now that they can be safely delivered in older patients with comorbidities, just as they can in younger patients. So maybe we don't think about that so much, but definitely lifestyle factors and the patient preference and what they're, what they're, um, what fits in with their lifestyle in terms of receiving the treatment. And I've put a few different issues down here. Because essentially, when we're talking about the pros and cons and patient preference, we're talking about the difference between a fixed duration treatment. So either venetoclax and abinutuzumab for a year or venetoclax and ibrutinib for 15 months or continuous therapy with a, with a BTKI, be it either ibrutinib or acalabrutinib on its own continuously. And I think there are certain things that could come into both pros and cons for, for different patients. For example, I think some patients might want a fixed duration treatment. I'm on my treatment, then it ends. I can forget about it. Whereas other patients might actually like the reassurance of remaining on treatment. And when their treatment finishes, they might be worried. Does that mean my CLL is coming back? And so I'm, I'm worrying about it. And then on the flip side of that, taking a tablet every single day indefinitely on continuous therapy is a constant reminder um, that you've got CLL because you're taking a treatment for it every single day. Or in some patients, is that reassuring? In terms of toxicities, if we're talking about the fixed duration venetoclax based regimens, then if we're, we've got to remember the certain toxicities that are associated with that. Um, the addition of abinutuzumab need, means the need for attending for intravenous infusions and the risk of infusion-related reactions, which are quite common with abinutuzumab. If we're giving it in combination with ibrutinib, then we've mentioned some of those cardiac toxicities alongside with diarrhea and the sort of reasonably high rates of neutropenia. 
And of course, if you're getting venetoclax, you're going to have to have all those um, recurrent trips into hospital for that five week um, up titration period. But fixed duration, you'll get to the end of your treatment and you won't be exposed to the toxicities of treatment indefinitely as you will be on continuous BTKI treatment. So a lot of different things to think about. And obviously some of these will come down to patient preference. Do they wanna be on a tablet indefinitely? Do they wanna just get this over and done with? Can they be bothered with the um, hospital attendances that are required with the venetuzumab infusions or phenetical up titration, et cetera? So definitely a lot to discuss with the patient. If we look at some of the um, CLL specific disease features that might influence our treatment choices. So I'm going to talk about IGVH status first. So Ros has shown us uh, the data that has shown us that patients with unmutated IGVH status clearly do worse, um, certainly in the chemoimmunotherapy era, and we're also seeing it with some of the novel agents, than their mutated IGVH counterparts. So this is a CLL14 study, the study of venetoclaxabinutuzumab compared with chlorambucilabinutuzumab. This is the study that led to us having access to venetoclaxabinutuzumab in the front line. A very well-known study um, now with over six years of follow-up. And you can see here, if you ignore the maroon chlorambucilabinutuzumab lines, but just focus on the blue lines where we're looking at the venetoclaxabinutuzumab treated patients, the solid line is the patients with mutated IGVH, the dotted line, the patients with unmutated IGVH. And it's very clear that those curves are separating and that the patients with unmutated IGVH are not doing as well as those with mutated IGVH. So IGVH status definitely affects outcome when you're talking about treating patients with metaclaxabinutuzumab. Based on that data, I think in patients with mutated IGVH, venetoclaxabinutuzumab is a very good option. Um, we can see from that curve that the median progression-free survival has still not been reached after six years of follow-up. But the patients with unmutated IGVH aren't doing quite so well. So would they benefit from the uh, from the addition of I to I plus V or perhaps a BTKI alone. I'll show you this data from the Captivate study. So our fixed duration I plus V study in the younger fitter patients. So you can see in the chart on the left, we've got three different sections there. If you focus on the um, right hand section, which is all comers and the middle section, which is unmutated IGVH, we'll ignore the one on the left for now. And these uh, three sections, if we focus on that middle and right hand one, and then we've got a pale section, a very dark blue, and then the bright blue. So the pale section being um, 12 months after treatment has finished, the rate of CR in those patients. And then the dark blue section being two years after treatment's finished and the bright blue being three years after treatment's finished. So three years after patients have treat finished treatment. And you can see that when they compared the unmutated IGVH patients to all comers, we're not making a direct comparison here from unmutated to mutated IGVH, we're, we're looking at all comers in comparison, but the unmutated patients seem to be doing just as well. Um, three years after treatment, 43% um, CR rate. And in fact, if you look at that 12 months post-treatment, that pale gray bar, um, the unmutated patients looked as if they were doing especially well there compared to the all comers, 60% CR rate versus 54% CR rate. And if we look in the curves on the right hand side, um, the progression free survival Kaplan Meyer curves, you can see looking at the sort of turquoisey line at the top and the maroony line in the middle, that's comparing all comers again with the unmutated IGVH patients. And the lines aren't exactly overlapping each other, but they're pretty close together. We're not seeing that clear separation that we saw between the mutated and unmutated patients treated with metaclaxabinutuzumab. So is I plus V adding some benefit here for the unmutated patients? Progression free survival curves on the right there. I'll come back to mention something about the P53 as we go on later, because this green section is about the P53 patients. In the GLOW study, so our older comorbid patients treated with fixed duration I plus V for 15 months, focusing here on a comparison between patients in the left with unmutated IGVH on the right mutated IGVH status. And what's really noticeable here is that during treatment, um, you can see here we're talking about cycle three, cycle six, cycle nine of treatment. These green bars, the patients with unmutated IGVH are doing especially well. They're achieving undetectable MRD. So the green bars here indicating undetectable MRD. So MRD, minimal residual disease or measurable residual disease, when it's undetectable, indicating a very deep remission, a very sensitive um, measure of remission status and response. And when patients have finished treatment, 
the unmutated IGVH uh, group going up to 18 months from the end of treatment, we're still seeing very good levels of undetectable MRD in the unmutated uh, patients. So unmutated patients here seem to seeming to achieve deeper responses than the mutated IGVH patients when we look at their MRD status in the GLOW study. Well, do we need the venetoclax bit then? What about, is it just the addition of the abrutinib that's helped? Should we just be giving these patients a BTKI alone? This is from the Elevate TN study. So Elevate TN meaning treatment naive. Um, so this is a study comparing a calibrutinib. There is an acalibrutinib with a binituzumab arm. That's the um, turquoisey colored arm at the top of the curves. I'm ignoring that because we don't have access to that, but focusing on the orangey uh, colored curve, which is acalibrutinib alone in treatment naive patients and comparing unmutated IGVH in the top curve with mutated in the bottom curve. And you can see there, there's not much between them. So a BTKI alone um, may be adding, uh, may be more beneficial in these unmutated IGVH patients, certainly than venetoclax or venetuzumab, where we see much more of a um, separation between those two groups. So BTKI certainly does seem to be a useful drug in the unmutated IGVH patients. So unmutated IGVH patients, we have options. We can see from the CLL14 data I showed you first, that the unmutated patients are not doing as well as their mutated counterparts, but still they have a median progression-free survival of over five years. It's not dismal, and it does. it is a fixed duration treatment without any of the cardiac um, additional risks of adding in abrutinib to the mix. So I don't think we necessarily need to rule it out as an option. Um, I plus V, I think we need to wait and see longer. Um, and I'm sure that George will be asking us lots of questions about this and we can have a good discussion about this. But I plus V, I think, may well add some benefit for these unmutated IGVH patients. It will be good to see for longer um, how those curves pan out and when um, the authors show us the unmutated versus mutated compared directly. But again, a fixed duration treatment, possibly a greater side effect burden in terms of neutropenia, diarrhea, and also those cardiac risks. What about BTKI monotherapy? Continuous drug, longer exposure to, to toxicities, but very easy for the patient to take, and does seem to be showing that it is a very useful drug in the unmutated IGVH patients. So I think we have options. What about in patients with P53 mutations? Somebody's already asked on the chat uh, whether in the era of novel agencies, DEL17P or a P53 mutation still an adverse prognostic factor. I think it is. Um, let's have a look at some of the data, bearing in mind the sort of rough three options we have of treatments in our head, venetoclax, venetuzumab, I plus V, BTKI monotherapy. So going back to that CLL14 study, ignoring the maroon curves of chlorambicil and venetuzumab, we're not interested in that now. We're just focusing on venetoclax and venetuzumab in combination. And again, the um, dotted line being here, uh, dotted line being patients with no P53 mutation or deletion, the solid blue line, being patients treated with venetoclax venetuzumab, but in the presence of either a P53 deletion and or a P53 mutation. And clearly the curve separating here. So P53 aberration, including deletion or mutation, does have a significant adverse impact on outcomes of venetoclax venetuzumab. What about BTKIs? Again, looking at that Elevate TN study, so the treatment naive frontline patients, Again, ignoring that um, maroon line at the top, which is a calibrutinib with um, a benetuzumab. But if we just look at the two yellowy, yellowy, greeny colored lines, um, those are patients. Uh, the solid line is with a DEL17P or mutated P53 and the dotted yellow line without. And those yellow lines are a calibrutinib monotherapy treated patients. And there's virtually nothing between them. So here we're seeing it using a calibrutinib in the front line. No difference in the progression free survival at 48 months follow up and regardless of the presence or absence of P53 aberration. We always have to bear in mind that P53, particularly in the frontline setting, is uncommon. And um, so when we're looking at these curves here, of 179 patients treated with acalabrutinib alone in this study, 23 of them had a P53 aberration. When we look at I plus V, now we're looking at P53 aberrations, so those green bits that we ignored before, um, you can see here in the um, progression-free survival curve on the right and also in the CR rate once patients come off treatment in the left-hand bars um, that the P53 aberrant patients are losing that complete response rate more quickly than the all-comers and their progression-free survival curve is not doing as well as the all-comer patients. Why is that? These patients are getting a BTKI as well. 
Well, is it because it's not a continuous BTKI therapy because it's a fixed duration treatment and then the patient stops treatment? So is it that continuous BTKI therapy like we just looked at in the Elevate TN study is better um, in the setting of a P53 aberration? So choosing treatment options for DEL17P or P53 mutations. Again, all of these are options. There's no absolute right and wrong. But I think as things currently stand, people would often tend towards giving patients a continuous BTKI, and that seems to be preferable in the setting of a P53 aberration in terms of outcomes. So my summary so far in frontline in 2023, again, my first most important thing to say is there are options um, and patient discussion is very important. There is no absolute right or wrong of which is the right treatment to give in, in specific situations. It is partly a patient discussion about what they want in terms of time commitment, side effects, ease of delivering the treatment, etc. I think my default setting is venetoxibinutuzumab as my go-to option. And certainly in a mutated IGBH patient with no P53 aberration, that would be my choice. In a patient with a P P53 aberration, and certainly patients who are not keen for commitment of uh, venetoclax titration, certainly older, frailer patients who just don't want all those trips into hospital and rather take a, a tablet at home, um, then I would be choosing a BTKI, continuous monotherapy in the form of acalabrutinib. But now we have I plus V, so where should we be fitting it? Well, I will certainly be wary of patients with um, high risk factors for cardiac toxicity. And I'm not, as things currently stand, going to be offering this to older patients with cardiac risk factors. I'd be very concerned about them. Um, but maybe younger patients, patients with unmutated IGVH status, could they especially benefit from this combination? My last few slides, I'm going to go on and just talk a little bit about Zanabrutinib. As I've said already, um, Zanabrutinib is being considered by NICE. Um, the company made an initial submission to NICE, and then there have been some changes along the way. So we're awaiting the outcomes, and we're expecting to hear something about access um, to zanabrutinib in the relapsed refractory population, whether it's approved by NICE, possibly in the autumn, um, but in frontline patients has yet to be confirmed. And we don't know exactly which patient populations NICE uh, may or may not give us access to zanabrutinib in. So this is currently up in the air. Um, but I'll show you a little bit of data about this. So Zanabrishnib is a second generation BTKI. Um, and I'm going to talk about two different studies, the Sequoia study, which is a frontline treatment naive CLL patient study, and the Alpine study, which is relapsed refractory patients. So first of all, the Sequoia study. So a randomized study. There were two cohorts of patients. Cohort one, the top cohort, patients did not have a DEL17P or P53 mutation. In cohort two, they did. So all the cohort two patients have a P53 aberration. In cohort one with no P53 aberration, patients were randomized to either zanabrutinib monotherapy indefinitely, so continuous monotherapy, or bendamustine and rituximab. These are untreated patients. Um, and if we look in the red box here, like the CLL14 population and the GLOW study population, these are older patients with comorbidities, specifically patients who are considered unsuitable for treatment with FCR. These patients have to be considered suitable for treatment with bendamustine rituximab, which is not totally straightforward, easy chemotherapy. So I don't think we're talking about a very unfit patient population, but patients that the physicians considered unsuitable for treatment with FCR, which is obviously tough stuff. Again, not a surprising result to see that the novel agent Zanabrutinib is doing better than the chemoimmunotherapy. But again, just showing you this for a bit of a sort of line in the sand about outcomes that our patients could expect. So this is a median follow-up um, of three and a half years, seeing a progression-free survival of 82% in the Zanabrutinib treated arm. Have a look at the complete remission rates there. You can see that they're um, quite a bit lower than we saw with the I plus V combination. We know that to be a thing with BTKI monotherapy, but we see quite low levels of undetectable MRD or complete remission. But again, as we said, does that matter? If your patient is on a continuous treatment, if they haven't achieved a complete remission, but they're well um, and, and many of their symptoms and signs have gone away and their blood counts have improved, then does it matter that they haven't achieved a CR? It's a different way of treating things compared to when we're thinking about aggressive lymphomas or aggressive leukemias. Um, in the Sequoia study, um, 
So looking at specifically in cohort two, so the deletion 17P, P53 mutation cohort. And again, you can see really excellent progression-free survival um, in the orange, so in the progression-free survival here um, in xanabrutinib patients. So in this cohort, patients only received xanabrutinib if they weren't randomized to chemoimmunotherapy. And you can see here that 79% progression-free survival um, at, at this medium follow-up of over three and a half years similar to what we've seen and would expect to see with BT-carrier monotherapy in that situation. Um, in the Alpine study now, so these are relapsed refractory CLL patients. Um, these patients could not have received prior BT-carrier therapy. They had received at least one prior line of therapy for CLL. And that this is a head-to-head -head study. So as Ros has already said, interesting to see data where we can see the BTKIs compared head-to-head. -head. This is a head-to-head -head study of xanabrutinib versus abrutinib in these um, relapsed refractory patients. When you look at this curve, the instant sort of feeling is, goodness, xanabrutinib is clearly doing better than abrutinib. Maybe it is. Um, there was a, a crossover was allowed in this study. So patients on abrutinib were able to cross over onto the xanabrutinib uh, arm instead. And certainly patients, this isn't early abrutinib studies now. We're not talking about the first time patients have ever heard of or seen a BTKI in early novel agent studies. Some patients are quite savvy. They know that there are you know, newer generation BTK inhibitors. And so patients uh, with the potential option to change over to xanabrutinib who are experienced toxicities with ibrutinib um, may well have favored this crossover arm into the xanabrutinib. So I think it's hard to know for definite how much better um, xanabrutinib is doing here compared to ibrutinib. I think we can say it's certainly as good as ibrutinib when we see this direct head-to-head -head study. Um, Worth noting that we know from previous studies, historical data in abrutinib in the relapsed refractory setting, the patient outcomes looked a bit better than the abrutinib arm here. So it has some raised some questions about exactly what was going on with that abrutinib patient population in this study. But I think we can say that xanabrutinib is at least as good as abrutinib. But looking at the side effects, because I think that's one of the key defining issues now when we're looking at the BTK inhibitors, we want to know whether they're as good as abrutinib or are they better, but we want to know about toxicities because we know about um, the abrutinib related cardiovascular toxicities, which can be an issue in some patients. And we've seen in the I plus V combination certainly could be an issue. And I think it's worth mentioning here um, that in terms of neutropenia, infection, hypertension, they were broadly similar between the two arms, abrutinib and uh, xanabrutinib in this study. But in terms of the cardiac disorders and specifically patients needing to discontinue drug due to cardiac disorders, the rate of that was much lower um, in the xanabrutinib arm than in the abrutinib arm. There were six deaths due to cardiac complications in the abrutinib group. So we have seen head-to-head -head studies now of acalabrutinib versus ibrutinib head-to-head -head study, the Elevate RR, relapsed refractory study. Um, uh, Ros showed you some data on that earlier. And now we have the Alpine study, xanabrutinib versus abrutinib head-to-head. -head. So it is a useful way of seeing the uh, equivalent efficacies and also the side effect profile. We don't have any head-to-head -head data comparing acalabrutinib with xanabrutinib. This is just a little reminder about the Elevate RR studies, so the head-to-head -head study of acalabrutinib versus abrutinib. And um, Ros showed you the curves earlier, which completely um, overlap in terms of efficacy. So they do seem to be equivalent in terms of efficacy. But certainly when we look at the um, incidence of AF with abrutinib in the brew line, acalabrutinib in the sort of dark maroony line, and the incidence of hypertension, patients on acalabrutinib are experiencing fewer toxicities. And also when we look in the little table at the top right, in terms of um, uh, all grade bleeding events, the acalabrutinib patients seem to be doing better. So we have a multiple choice of BTKIs now, and potentially, depending on whether we get access through NICE um, at some point this year, we may well be able to add xanabrutinib to that list. We don't yet know in which specific patient groups we may have access to it. But I think in terms of efficacy, we know from the Elevate RR study that acalabrutinib appears non-inferior or equivalent to abrutinib. And xanabrutinib, I would say, appears at least as good, if not better, um, than abrutinib in the Alpine study. In terms of side effect profiles, I think it's a bit tricky. I wonder if maybe acalabrutinib has the edge overall when we look at all side effects, including um, side effects such as bleeding. But when we look at xanabrutinib, the specific cardiac profile does seem to look superior. Um, so again, I think that's something we'll be looking at in terms of making treatment choices for our patients. So coming to the end now, in summary, 
Um, what's new in 2023? Well, we have plenty of novel agents available to us already in 2022, but in 2023, we now have the addition of I plus V, and maybe we have Zana Brutinib to come. I think I've hopefully shown you that I plus V is deliverable in all ages and in the setting of comorbidities in the GLOW and Captivate studies, but we definitely need to be aware of older patients, particularly those with cardiac toxicity and those risks of um, significant and severe cardiac uh, adverse events. We know this is a fixed duration treatment. Tumulysis doesn't seem to be an issue, though you do still need to go through the five week ramp up period. So in logistical terms, it is still an issue, but in terms of actually seeing TLS events, that doesn't seem to be such a problem. I would definitely be warning patients about neutropenia and diarrhea if they were starting on I plus V. Which patients should we be choosing it for? I'm sure we'll have plenty of discussion. My sort of general go-to would be mutated IGVH patients. I would be recommending Ven-O. We know those patients are doing really well. Unmutated IGVH patients, I'm going to say, are not sorted yet. Is I plus V the way to go? A BTK inhibitor alone? Should we just stick with Veno? Because I did show you that they still have a median progression free survival of over five years. It's not dreadful. In the setting of a P53 aberration, I would certainly be favoring a continuous BTKI. Um, and we've seen that certainly with the Elevate TN A calibration of data. But with all of these treatment decisions, it is certainly a patient discussion because of all of those other logistical features around patient preference and what's involved in the treatment regimens. And I managed to get onto a third summary slide. So a quick summary about Zanabrushnib. I've shown you some data in the Sequoia study in the front line, in the Alpine study, in the relapsed refractory setting. We're yet to find out what access we will have in the UK and when. But in my head, Zanabrushnib is at least as good as a Brushnib, maybe better. Um, and in terms of side effect profile, it is certainly superior to a brutinib in terms of cardiac risks. Um, I'll end it there and we can certainly go on to some questions and discussion and I'll stop sharing my screen. Ellen, that was the most fantastic talk. That was really interesting how you covered off these new areas of CLL and how our world is again changing. And you opened up these difficult areas of discussion, which it's going to be great to try and unpack um, because it is straightforward. And I suspect we have not got easy answers uh, now. So in terms of our panel, I see Nicholas has put on his video. Excellent. So Nick from Nottingham is going to be able to join us uh, in a bit of panel debate because this is quite a tricky area. And I have to um, show my uh, cards of uh, uh, Bias, influence, involvement. I don't know. I've been involved with the GLOW trial uh, since the beginning. Uh, we are just, we've just literally submitted the update of the data. So I've seen a lot of this coming through. A very effective protocol, but clearly needs a lot of unpacking in terms of discussion. So I think the the three broad areas I'm going to discuss while we're waiting for other questions coming in are clearly the toxicity and how we approach that with I plus V and how it influences patient selection. The second area is this really difficult mutated, unmutated um, with I plus V. Uh, it, we would love the unmutated IGHVs to be a nice packaged area that we could say there for I plus V. I suspect it isn't quite as easy as that. And Paolo Guy is a little bit naughty with that Lugano presentation, putting all patients and unmutated instead of doing what he knows he should do, is mutated, unmutated. So he's double plotted on that line to... Because unfortunately, I have to be honest with our data, figure one you'll see in the paper, we're just hopefully going to get published very soon, is showing the unmutated in the GLOW trial at three years, it's 70%. So they are falling off the curve. I, I just think unmutated are not yet solved. Um, and then, of course, the other area of discussion, ZANU, where that fits in. We didn't sort of perhaps unpack the 17p deleted. Does ZANU have a bit of an edge in that area? I don't know. It's quite interesting areas of debate. So toxicity. The GLOW trial and the CAPTIVATE trial, you can't get better differences in toxicity. But I always start off by reminding people that the GLOW trial, it was a small trial. It was powered against chlorambus libinutuzumab. And that's why they were able to get that as a registrational trial with only 106 patients per arm. So it means any analysis of subgroups, as Pete Hillman always says, is fraught with difficulty because we're starting with small numbers. When it was published, you know, that first publication, the seven grade five adverse events. So seven out of 106 patients died because of toxicity. You know, that's what that means. If you actually look at the overall survival plots, we know about 10, 11 patients had died by month 15. Not all of them still on therapy. But it means if you are following that trial correctly and you're consenting somebody over 65 or COVID, you have to say there's a five to 10 percent chance you uh, will die within the first 15 months. 
Now, we know that the deaths were heavily weighted towards the properly comorbid, and it was internationally recruited. Um, you know, I'm not passing judgmental comment, but I know some of those deaths happened in other healthcare environments, uh, neutropenia, sepsis related deaths. Um, does so should we approach that with caution because this remarkable data of seeing those flat curves because obviously that up to 42 months in the globe trial well, there were 15 deaths in the experimental arm but very few beyond the end of treatment and so we know and that's why I had four patients on the experimental arm pretty frail people second half of 70s who have done really well and they haven't relapsed so we're faced with that dilemma um and, and I think so Helen the way you I love the way you um highlighted these problems of how we approach that toxicity and you went for cardiac toxicity which I think we would all agree with I think I also feel about any frailty markers how you'd cope with the neutropenia because as you as you highlighted 36 percent neutropenia it's the recurrent neutropenia and I think we've learned quite a bit more that ibrutinib can impact on venetoclax excretion and so I think having a low threshold for perhaps cutting back your venetoclax dosing um, I had a number of patients I really struggled, battled through on the trial, the neutropenia being the issue. Um, so, Helen, you, you illustrate those points. Nick is new to this discussion. He wasn't in our first panel. Let me jump on Nick as a first person. So um, the toxicity of, of I plus V when you have a patient in your clinic, let's forget the mutated or unmutated. What toxicity things would sway you to using it or not use it? <clears throat> hi, uh, hi, George. Thank you. Uh, I think I think um, the toxicities uh, now, in general, not just for I plus V, but also for uh, BTK inhibitors uh, in general, are something we need to be um, very careful with uh, in terms of how we define them and how we uh, sort of uh, tease out which which are the ones that are precluding our patients to receive one one uh, one. Uh, one treatment or the other and and um, cardiovascular comorbidities um, for example is a very broad term and it doesn't it, it does encompasses everything AF uh, you know uh, 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 complete blocks complete heart blocks where the patient has coronary coronary heart disease and they've had a history of heart attacks where they have a um, uh, triple bypass surgery and all of that is sort of encompassed in it and then I think we have to be um, we have to learn to be more um, um, specific on what we're dealing with and what uh, and, and what is actually the, the problem. And in, for, uh, for I plus V specifically, I think the risk is basically, uh, or the highest risk, cardiac sudden death. And I think that should be um, uh, that should be um, that that's what should be taken care of. So I probably would not uh, be too concerned about AF, for example, because it's a fixed duration and the. And even if the patient gets AF during treatment, then once if, if it's if it's uh, if it's just a, a induced AF, for example, it might revert after treatment if you stop it. So I would be wary about people with risk of sudden death, such as significant structural cardiac abnormalities uh, and and history of um, of coronary heart disease that would then um, cause them to have you know that that you know that flick of sudden death that could be com com complicated. Uh, and also from the experience we've got with flare in I plus V, I think uh, the, the combination is certainly is certainly harder for older folk, and and uh, the diarrhea sometimes can be quite disabling, and uh, uh, it's difficult. That that's one that one is really difficult to predict. But I would certainly be worried with people who have previous um, um, bowel problems, short bowels, um, IBS, and that kind of. Uh, thing that would uh, sway you, and th I think those are the two main. Uh, and the, the neutropenia is a problem, but um, uh, I think, in, in, as you say, in in our in our uh, health service, in which we have a more um, um, close uh, monitoring of the patients, I don't think that's going to be a big uh, issue for us in the UK. I think to, so, Nick, as I push back, so you thank you for mentioning flare. Of course, we are familiar with flare in the UK, but by definition, those were younger, fitter patients because they were fitter for randomization to FCR, I think, which has influenced us. And I'm going to bring peers in about the duration of treatment because there was some interesting molecular data from ASH. I know peers is all over that. So I think I like those comments. I like the, the neutropenia and the healthcare environment. I must admit, I also, so I plus V, I think if people are on that protocol, for those 
15 months, I think, stressing that basically you're up every month, you're following them for 15 months, you're all over them. It is different from giving them other tablet therapy and off you go. And I, I, I think that links into your comment about our different healthcare environments. And we have this ability to follow our patients relatively closely. And I think that is part of the trade. You're on a fixed duration, which is great. So we'll follow you really closely. And then you can have your very far follow ups going forward. So I'm going to actually I'm going to go Roz first and then Piers. And Lily, I will be ringing you as well. So Roz, to keep it moving, because I know we've got to, to a quarter past. And I do want to talk about IGHV. Toxicity. Do you have any other points you would raise on toxicity? Yeah, I think it's, um, I think, I think again, probably it's involving the patient in the discussions, isn't it? It's, it's um, trying to, uh, trying for all of us to understand what the trade-offs are. And, um, you know, it, it, if, if your chance of being treatment free with I plus V is, significantly higher then you know are you prepared to to have all the hospital visits and the monitoring and the risk of infection and admission and the diarrhea or um you know and I suppose time is going to make that easier for us isn't it because we'll get more data um and more information on what happens in the different subgroups but I think I mean I feel quite um I think I find it quite difficult at the minute to know how to recommend I plus V. That's me being honest. Yeah, I, no, no, no. I think I think we're all a bit like that. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Okay. So actually before I go to sorry Ros cutting you off there, but I That's think right. I'm aware of time. Uh Lelia, do you have any points on those toxicity things before I bring peers in? Uh, well, maybe my declare my conflict of interest. I was a participant in Clarity's clarity, so I've had I plus V. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's yeah I guess the first it is so much about discussion with patients I've had FCR and I've had I plus V uh, I continue on eye monotherapy and it's the, it, the, it's such it's so easy to dismiss the, the side effects even the relatively minor ones of the oral treatments but they go on forever um, and that's, I think, going back to Helen's slide of the pros and cons, I think people have such different views. And I think one of the factors in CLL for the continuous therapy is that you come off, folk call, a lot of patients, call, a lot of the CLL community calls that returning to watch and wait. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something to address. It links back to our earlier discussions about the anxieties. And you, everyone knows there's no cure, so it doesn't feel like, you're being, you know, there's lots of cancers where you get your treatment and there's a potential for cure and you're followed up and then you're released from follow-up. But it is amazing, isn't it, Lily, that, that different, you have some patients say, you know, I take my blood pressure tablets, I'm going to take my egg palette, I'm not fussed. And then you have other patients who simply can't settle into that point of view. Yeah. Um, and it's exactly as Helen had on her slide. For some people, it's the, the daily reminder, your first thought is take your tablets, I've still got CLL. And for other people, it's I can't bear not to be on treatment. It's just too anxiety provoking. But I think in a way we could do more to come to this point with a more open mind in this changing era of therapy. To, it's why this watch and wait is such an important time in the CLL care um, for, pe for people in that community. And it's not just, as again, I think you referred to, it, it's not just the person, it's their family as well. Mm, yeah. Now, so to keep it moving, um, I, Piers, I'm going to now bring you in on IGHV and I'm, Helen, now I'm going to flip back to you. So Piers, you, we had a lot of debate at ASH, didn't we, that isn't it fascinating that I plus V seems to get more MRD negative remissions than the unmutated IGHV, but they seem to relapse faster. So the clonal dynamics take over and then this endless debate that we're probably just not allowed to give it long enough which is the great shame because if you've been taking it for a year and you're doing fine you're we're going to be fine taking it for two or three but I don't know you, you've seen all the data peers do you have anything coming clear in your mind about mutated unmutated where we should be going well the mutated patients do really well with everything and um, I think, therefore, your choice of treatment should be much more around. And th this is a generalisation, because, of course, we all have a few mutated patients who've got other adverse genomics. 
But, you know, if you just take that, and I do think for mutated patients, it, sh- the, the, it really is around what is the impact of the delivery of the treatment to you and the side effects and the, the, the giving it and, and everything else. And I think we really should be much more focused around around that and then what's right for the patient do they want to be i mean because there's nothing wrong with giving continuous btki to a mutated patient i've got very very happy patients who've been on acal actually from the original studies for eight years no problems at all i'm very happy to take it so unmutated patients or ones with genomics that you don't like the look of whatever you however you're going to define that be it complex carrier type be it p53 be it your own sort of personal I think then you need to be thinking about the efficacy of these regimes. Continuous BTKI, whichever BTKI is very good for CLL. But and 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 I I'm personally disappointed by this IMV regime in a way. I've over the last I mean maybe talking too much to you, George, actually. But um <laughs> in terms of I'm worried about the side effects for the older patients. And for the younger patients who tend to be the ones with the genomically more difficult to treat disease, I don't think we're doing it right. I think we need it longer than 15 months. And so with the data we've got, I, I'm not convinced that IMV is, is if a way it's been given here, it's a way forward. Now, I'm about to give a talk about IMV <laughs> as it happens. But <laughs> um, the, the, the MRD is interesting and it tells us that it's not a one off MRD that we should be doing with patients if we're going to do it and and i mean we can have a whole debate about whether we should be doing any mrd testing or not but for this combination for the btki bcl2 i combination a one-off mrd isn't really telling us that much you need to do it more than that because it's the it's the pattern of it because you're right you get this deeper blood and bone marrow remission because that's what of course we're testing with mrd with imv with unmutated cases but it comes off again quicker as well. And again, that's one of the things that the FLAIR study has been exploring, and I'm, I will show some slides coming up to talk about that a bit. So I think this is quite a nice prelude to that. Um, I'm not sure I've answered your question. <laughs> I think we all have the uncertainty, though. That's the problem. Yeah. And, and, and I think, um, so it, I think Helen's what slide, which said it's an option, is absolutely right. And and I, I again, I'll come back to my MD, MDT point people want me to say and they do seem to turn to me in our network you know which you know you are, which you are the right patient. patient and 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 the answer is it's individual patients and and that there isn't a right answer for anybody and actually we're incredibly lucky we've got such great oh. treatment for so many of our patients here there are a small proportion of patients we're not serving well um both by letting their disease progress or, you know, or, or their disease progress, or because we've given them toxicities, which we didn't necessarily need to do. No, wise words. So, Piers, before I'm going to link in Helen to round off, I'm just going to go to the chat because, thank you, there's some good questions coming in. Uh, using V plus I causing more adverse events, is it worth it? Uh, I guess that's what we've been throwing around here. How about just using V or I on their own? So, you're, you're abs- it's this constant debate with CLL is that if you have a combination of available therapies that will already meet the natural life expectancy of that patient, inevitably toxicity becomes a dominant issue because if you have a 72 year old who you sweepingly say has an actuarial 10 year life expectancy our current weapons can get us there most likely and so therefore we 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 don't want to we don't want to compromise patients quality of life so that's the central part is zano privately yes i've got if you're running private clinics i've got a couple of zano the main insurers tend as you just remind you all they tend to recognize EMA and then carry over to MHRA licensing. So if a drug is approved, uh, but not yet NICE approved, most of the insurers, if you write the right reports, will uh, allow you to get that. With ACAL, I wasn't VT a big risk factor. So I think it's probably, I'm just going to sweepingly say, the second generation ones have less in the way of uh, the, the major cardiac risk factors. And I think that's both atrial and ventricular. I think Helen just pointed out, perhaps Zanu has just the edge, not with hypertension, but in terms of if you're really dissecting the cardiac risk per se, I think uh, Zanu might just sway it. So one of my chaps have just started on Zanu in the relapse rather than Acala, had actually had pretty bad ventricular arrhythmias, had a pacemaker fitted, and I thought, you know what, he's gone, he's relapsed on the back of VR, 
So VR was a solution three or four years ago. He's now relapsed. He's in the private clinic and I put him on Zani. Uh, do we use FCR at all now? Not really. I think, you know, who knows? Five, 10 years, we might have the patients. We've gone through all of our drugs and we're coming back. But uh, And then what do you think about combinations with vet, with other BTKIs? Well, peers might talk about that. There's obviously some data coming through, but they are not let licensed. So Helen, the last two minutes before we close this session, you, you've heard all this debate those three areas, and we didn't really come on to 17P, did we? But um, toxicity, IGH3 mutational status, and uh, 17P. Give us some overall summary points. I hoped you and Piers were going to tell me what to do with the unmutated patients, and I'm disappointed. That's my summary. Oh, dear. Oh, Helen, come on. It's like Piers saying everyone looks to him, and then I get worried people look to me. But my trick on the is, is always... No, it's it's all tricky, isn't it? It, would, it would, As you said at the start, um, George, it would be lovely that this had all been nicely packaged up, wouldn't it? And we could say, oh, good, we've got unmutated sorted, but it doesn't seem to be the case um, necessarily. And I'll be interested to see the, the publication you're talking about um, in GLOW, because, I mean, we could obviously see those curves in GLOW separating on a previous publication. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess we've, we've still got lots to lots to think about with unmutated. It certainly is not sorted. I think I do approve, uh, appreciate that the point you made about Veno, let's remember that Veno for unmutated GHV, it is still a well-tolerated regimen. You've got patients getting five, six years of remissions, and then they'd flip on to a BTK, which, you know, that point, Zanu, A color, whatever. There are very good options. And then rotating back onto a venetoclax space. And then, as Piers will be talking about some of the non-covalent BTKs, there are many options. So, so starting an unmutated patient or starting a mutated patient on any of these options still has very good efficacy potential for the clear majority of our patients. Thank you ever so much, Helen. Brilliant session and to the panellists.